Hello and welcome. I'd like to introduce Dr. Kevin Haggerty. He is a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Alberta. He is the editor of the Canadian Journal of Sociology and a Canadian Research Chair. Kevin has taught various courses and seminars at the undergraduate and graduate level, including surveillance studies, sociology of modernity, and sociology of prisons, a seminar he teaches collaboratively with Dr. Sandra Bisarius. Kevin, some of your most prominent works are in the field of surveillance, including the Surveillance Assemblage, which was published in the BJS. What was it that interests you in the field of surveillance and risk? Well, I guess the surveillance thing goes back a long way. And I can remember talking with my father in the backyard about hypothetically what would happen if we had cameras in public on the street corner. At the time, the Soviet Union uh, was, was doing this kind of stuff. So, you know, I look back and it's like it was always kind of a concern of kind of dystopian thing. One of those things that grew organically as I moved more into the academy, I mean, it's one of the, the great privileges of this job is you can gravitate to things that kind of interest you. And I just kind of found that and I found lots of discussions about Foucault, which was dominating kind of um, a lot of criminology at the time, just was really quite organic. And how did that tie into like some of your works on risk with like Aaron Doyle as well? Right. Uh, Aaron is a colleague of mine. We were doing our PhD together. Aaron did stuff more on risk and insurance with our both our supervisor, Richard Erickson. I was doing more stuff around risk and policing. At the time, people were thinking about surveillance and the police in terms of cameras and espionage and that kind of stuff. And we were, you know, a little early in, in the curve thinking about police information systems, data, what we now kind of call data valence. And do you see surveillance coming into the current works you're doing now? I think the last maybe five or so so years, uh, Sandra B. Series and I have been working more in terms of prisons. Personally, I've taken a whole other kind of trajectory. I have not walked away from the study of surveillance, but I've set it aside, I think, for a while. Sometimes people can just become sort of exhausted with a field of study. I'd been studying surveillance for a long time. I mean, as you know, as somebody who's been part of this research, you know, the surveillance dynamics in prison are really nothing like what a lot of the literature would tell you in terms of this oppressive kind of, you know, Foucauldian watching of everything. Right. In many ways, it's the exact opposite. It's like a, a story about negligence and invisibility. In terms of your expansion into empirical research, as one of the PIs for the larger Alberta Prison Project, what are some important skills or methodological groundings that you believe are really important to share with others who aim to do empirical research? With vulnerable populations, I think the starting point is a, a sense of empathy. Yeah. Um, being able to sort of relate to people who have very, very different backgrounds than yours. I mean, and never really truly, you know, understanding them, but at least being appreciative of the challenges of talking across cultural and racial and gender differences. I think that's more than any kind of technological skill that people have. Mm -hmm. I think it's that kind of sensitivity. You can learn the other stuff. And uh, so I think that it's biographical and it's human uh, centered. In terms of this current research project you guys have been doing for over, how many years has it been at this point? Four or five years, I think. Right, yeah. So right now, is there any certain areas that you've become really interested in and want to expand potentially right. with students? Uh, for me, I, I, <laughs> it's challenging because both Sandra and I were not prison scholars before we mm -hmm. came to this. So much of this is new to us. The stuff we publish on, so you'd be stuff like on fentanyl in prison or multiculturalism in prison or discretion in prison. Each one of these is its own field, the study of discretion, yeah. the study of ethnicity, the study of drugs. And we're kind of chasing ourselves, constantly trying to get up to speed with connecting what we're finding with actually what's been said already and what's new. In terms of what I would like to sit down and, and do at some point in the near future is I'd like to write a book uh, on drugs in prison. You can learn so much about who's in prison, why they're in prison, the day-to-day -day life of prison, everything from like the influence of you know drugs broadly conceived to the day-to-day -day prison trade and the dynamics of gangs to you know how people manage trauma. It touches almost everything. In terms of actually exploring different areas and teaching, what would you say is your favorite course or seminar to teach? Mm. Yeah, so I've years ago I created 
um, a course called the Sociology of Killing, which is a fourth year course. But it's my favorite course for lots of reasons. I think fourth year seminars with undergraduate students are fantastic. They're small, 20, 25 uh, students. The course covers essentially the extremes of human behavior. So it talks about predictable things, maybe homicide and but it also talks about femicide, but then it moves into sort of institutional practices. You know, not all killing is a crime. So it talks about capital punishment and warfare and genocide. And so it's, it's, it's a fantastic course. What do you hope students take away from this seminar? It, it exposes them to sort of different contexts than they probably never kind of experienced. So I want to teach them a little bit about writing. I want to teach them a little bit about history and things that maybe they don't know about. In terms of the larger center for criminological research, for you, what is significant about the formation of this center? Um, and what is it going to be giving back to students and the community? It gives back to research experience, the possibility of connecting with a wide range of both stakeholders, community groups, and governmental agencies or organizations. The uh, CCR, the Center for Criminological Research, has relationships with, you know, police and correctional facilities, but it also has relationships with Indigenous organizations and other types of racialized groups, um, women's organizations. I think that that's really kind of what's key, is trying to forge these types of meaningful relationships uh, that can hopefully bring about some reforms. So the collaborative intent behind the CCR is really evident. How about the capacities for interdisciplinary work and research? The center is not even a year old yet. Mm -hmm. uh, it was formed out of the sociology department. We have a incredibly interdisciplinary sociology department. Uh, so it's already got, you know, for a criminology institute, it already has, it's attentive to a wider range of issues. And, but it's, I think the interdisciplinarity part is going to be who else comes along? What other types of people are attracted to this in terms of um, collaborative research? We're very keen on having people come visiting fellowships, maybe sort of uh, sabbatical here. So the, the interdisciplinary thing, I think, is nascent, but I think that it's something that we're keen on. So I guess for students who are interested in continuing their education through the Center of Criminological Research, what expectations do you have uh, for prospective students or advice to give? Maybe the most basic is treat it as your profession. Um, it's a job. Uh, at, at the MA level, it's slightly different. You know, the MA level is kind of people are learning kind of what sort of advanced research might look like, etc. But for PhD students, you know, it's your job. So think about it that way, approach it that way, think about time management, you know, balancing your, you know, just like any other job, you're gonna have to balance your life as well. You're gonna have to have sort of healthy relationships, getting a mentor. Mm -hmm. uh, probably the most important thing, again, I'm thinking about at the PhD level is your supervisor. And your supervisor in many ways is probably more important than the topic you study. Right. because the supervisor will be able to help you no matter what or broadly conceived your topic is. You're often known for years as being affiliated with your supervisor and the students also have to think about what they want from a supervisor and, and work that out fairly early on. So it takes a little bit of communication, particularly at the early stages. Outside of criminology and sociology, do you have any other passions or kind of disciplinary interests? passions. Um, well, I own a lot of guitars and fool around on them occasionally. So right. um, yeah, I wish I had more time or more motivation to play the guitar. But um, yeah, that's probably my my number one kind of hobby outside of the, um, the academy. So what would you say is your favorite genre? Oh, it's classic rock. The Neil Young's and the Led Zeppelin's and right. you know, all that kind of stuff. So what's your all time favorite uh, album? Led Zeppelin one. Probably. Okay, yeah, that's fair. I can support <laughs> that. And do you have any pets? Two cats. Um, they're sisters. They're gingers. One's named Fat Cat and one's named Skinny Cat, which is a problem because Fat Cat went on a diet and now they look pretty much the same. So you have to know their personalities to be able to distinguish them. But uh, yeah, usually Skinny Cat sits up on a shelf up here and watches me work and Fat Cat naps in the sunbeam. So they're probably enjoying some COVID home time. Oh yeah, yeah, they're like, I think they like having us around. <laughs> <laughs>